how to set personal boundaries. You know, healthy boundaries define what is appropriate and acceptable behavior in our relationships, behavior that keep both parties safe. Setting healthy boundaries is crucial for self-care and positive relationships. Personal boundaries differ from person to person and are mediated by various cultures, personalities, and even social context. For example, boundaries that may be appropriate in a business meeting may be weird and awkward and even absurd in a party of old friends. Certain boundaries define our expectations and ourselves and others in different kinds of relationships. And this morning, I want to invite us to indulge in six personal boundaries that we need to set. And the first boundary we need to set, they are physical boundaries. Physical boundaries. Now, you have a right to protect your personal space, your physical space. You have a right to determine how people shake your hands, how they hug you, or even who to hug you, and who not to hug you, and how to hug you, and for how long. You have a right, because there are people who extend the fellowship on you, on your shoulders. You have a right to determine the distance at which people should stand next to you, or even sit next to you. And usually these personal spaces are heavily abused, severely abused in public buses, public trains, public places, even in an airport, or even when you're getting in an aircraft. Uh, think about this. Different people, different families, different cultures have different styles of hugging each other. There are certain families and certain cultures where men can't hug women. In some cultures, it's awkward for men to hug men. They can only hug women. In some cultures, it's awkward for men to hug women. In 2 Corinthians 13, 12, Scripture says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And it's important to know that in that culture, the context under which the New Testament writings were done, they used to kiss each other. That's why Judas uh, betrayed Jesus with a kiss. It was commonplace in the culture that time. But again, the Apostle Paul adds the word a holy kiss. Greet one another with a holy kiss, which implies even them days. Perhaps there are people who are applying erotic kisses, sensual kisses. So the word here, holy kiss, means a pure motive, a pure heart. The objective is clean. One Bible scholar, Morgan, said uh, why Paul wrote that text. In those days, greeting each other with a kiss, erotic overtones were excluded. The kiss was a greeting, a sign of peace and Christian agape. In fact, some people could not even kiss each other on Friday because of the kiss that betrayed Jesus, the Judas' kiss. They eliminated, they eliminated the idea of kissing each other on, on Friday as culture began to evolve. But you as an individual, you as a child of God, I also give you a challenge. Just as you don't expect other people to overstep your personal boundaries and your personal space, don't occupy anyone's personal space. Don't do something to someone that they don't subscribe to, that they don't like. Respect their personal boundaries. Respect people's dress code. Respect their food. Respect their culture. Respect their language. Respect their lifestyle. And I'm glad that uh, in this church, we come from different cultures, different nationalities. And you may not know this, uh, for those of you who know I'm a Kenyan, even the Kenyans in this church are from very different cultures. And that's the joy of this place that we are different cultures. I am so excited and privileged to pastor people who come from different cultures. And uh, to the best of my observation, ever since we launched this ministry, people have respected different cultures. I think 
the people who come here are extremely international. <laughs> very exposed, very well mannered, very well disciplined. I congratulate you for that. Uh, the second personal boundary, number two, emotional boundaries. Emotional boundaries. You have a right to protect your emotional well-being. In other words, don't ever allow anyone to call you names, to insult you, to abuse you, or even to raise their voice on you, or to use a harsh and kind tone. Your human rights, it's only you who can protect them. I even dare say this, if a neither person speaking to you is a senior, like a parent, or a boss, or even this is your husband in the case of ladies, because scripture says you should submit to him. It doesn't matter who they are, no one has a right to abuse you. And for those of us literally from Africa, you need to listen to this carefully because we tolerate a lot of garbage from parents because our cultures are enslaving. They tell you you can soak in any abuse, any insult from a parent. I tell you that is not true. That is not the word of God. No one is supposed to abuse you because they are a father or a mother or even a boss. No one is supposed to abuse you on grounds of their seniority. If somebody insults you and abuses you for a very, very long time, you will become vegetative. If somebody calls you names, they tell you you're foolish, you're ugly, you are, you'll amount to nothing, you're not worth the living, someone wrote to me the other day, so many people write to me in my inbox. A lady wrote to me, the husband tells her, you smell worse than a dog. I mean, even if somebody had some hygiene issues, there is a better way of putting across the message. If somebody puts across the message in an unkind manner, you need to stand up and tell them this is not right. And I'm not suggesting that. The word of God is commanding you to defend your emotional well-being. Listen at Titus 2.15. Use all your power to stop people if they are doing wrong. Do not let anyone despise you. Think about this. Use all your power to stop people if they are doing wrong. You've got to sit with your boss and tell them, you are not going to call me names anymore. You are not my source. God is my source. This job may be the means God is using. If you're a teenager watching me online, you've got to tell your mom or your dad who has been calling you names, stop it. You've got to talk to me with respect and honor. How many here agree respect is mutual, is a two-way traffic? Do you agree with me? It cannot be lopsided. It cannot be a one-way traffic. And that's exactly what Paul was telling one of his spiritual sons, Titus. Stop people from calling you names, from abusing you, from misusing you. But then I also give you a challenge as a child of God. As you expect others to treat you with honor, with dignity, with respect, you too must treat your wife, you must treat your husband, you must treat colleague employees, you must treat your kids, you must treat your siblings, you must treat, you must treat your neighbors with honor, with dignity, with kindness. You set the standard of how you want others to talk to you. The tone you use on others, your choice of words, sets the standard, tells people what words are approved in your working vocabulary. And that's why Jesus said, do unto others as you'd wish them do unto you. Talk to others the way you want them to talk to you. Set the tone, set the standard of how you want others to handle you, to treat you, to talk to you. What tone do you want them to talk to you? In Colossians 4, 6, Paul says, Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Every word you speak should be gracious, full of grace. Words that are attractive, not repelling people. You are a magnet. Every word you speak is either attracting people to you or repelling people away from you. You are not neutral. You have magnetic power within you. So let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you have the right response for everyone. And people will learn how you like them to address you and to speak to you. That personal boundary, material boundaries. 
material boundaries. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a right to protect your personal belongings. No one has a right to your bank account or to your money. You have a right to give money to whoever you want and refuse to give whoever you want. Don't, you know, like I have seen a lot of homeless people and beggars stay next to a restaurant so that immediately you have eaten and as you walk out of the restaurant, they make you feel guilty for you enjoying your meal. Come on, eat properly. It is your meal. Do not be manipulated into, into giving. It has to come from your heart of hearts. It doesn't matter whether it's in church or families. The two places people are abused a lot is church and our loved ones who try to manipulate us to give what we had not planned to give. You have a right to deny anyone your phone or your car. You don't have to come and get my car. The fact that you had an accident does not give you right to me. I may have an extra car, but you don't have a right to my car. I, you have to ask with kindness, and if I deny you, it is my right. You have a right to host whoever you want or to deny them staying in your house. You don't have to be forced to host anyone in your house. I am not encouraging being mean. Generosity is a gift of God and give us receive. I'm only saying, don't allow especially relatives to abuse what you earn. There are some folks, when they hear somebody is in America, they immediately think you're a millionaire. And now you're the person who is supposed to be funding all their activities. You've got to decide how much you want to give. Don't give other guilt. Why? Even if you give other guilt, there is no blessing. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 to 13, a very interesting passage of scripture. Verse 10. Even when we were with you, we told you this. If any man will not work, do not let him eat. This is a repetition. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians, you will see Paul had spoken about it again. So he says, we told you, if anyone does not work, let them not eat. It is true these days we have women who keep a guy in the name of a husband. The guy watches TV the whole day, scrolls through the phone. You go, you do the bills, you come home and cook meals in the name of love. You don't love him, you're wasting him away. You're destroying that gentleman. And there are some parents who do that to adult children. Unless a child is incapacitated, if they are adults, either they get out of your house so that they learn how to pay the bills, or if you're going to stay in one house, then you're paying the bills together. The same way people do carpooling. We do house pooling. Give them the rate for the room. The way you would give an outsider the room rate. Why? For their own good, not for your good. Because the moment you allow people to receive things for nothing, you destroy their resourcefulness. And you know I like giving the example of an animal. You just need to get a lion in the jungle and lock him in a zoo. Feed him for three consecutive months every single day. If you release him back to the jungle, he's dead. He can't hunt anymore. He's still waiting for you to bring food. You treat a human being the same way you have the same result. When you give people something for nothing, you destroy their resourcefulness. There is simply no free lunch. It is God who has commanded everyone to work. Verse 11. We hear that some of you are lazy. You do not work, but you trouble other people. Paul is saying, used in a very harsh tone here, those who are not working, he's calling them by the right name, you are lazy. You are troubling other people. Every time you don't work, Every time you're not productive, guess what? You're riding on another man or another woman's sweat. That's basically what he's saying. You are troubling other people. I say, unless for sure you are incapacitated physically or mentally. Yes, we should support seniors. We should support young kids before we win them out of our families. We should support the sick, the invalid, people recovering. Verse 12. We say to such lazy people, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do your work quietly, earn your own food. In other words, get out of your couch, go to work. In a twist of events, the exact immediate verse, Paul says, 
my brothers and sisters, do not get tired of doing what is good. This, is, this looks ironic. This looks a great contradiction. He's saying if somebody does not work, don't give them food. Let them go work. And then he says, don't get tired of doing good. Implication. Doing good does not include aiding, laziness. Doing good does not include feeding, laziness. Doing good does not include destroying people's resourcefulness. Everyone is resourceful. That's why they are still alive. If they were not, God would have taken them away. Everyone is resourceful. Everyone can do something unless they're on a hospital bed. Everyone can do something. Let people do something. If they cannot get out there and hustle, they can do the dishes at home. They can prepare the meals. They can do the laundry. Everything has a money value. Every contribution counts. You also, I charge you by the masses of the living God. As a child of God, do not be a burden to anybody. Work. Do not be a burden to your family members. Contribute to the bills. Do not be a burden to the government. Pay the taxes. Every time you wait for the government to give you, you lower your bar, you lower your ceiling, you destroy your destiny and your potential because what they will give you is the bare minimum. Trust me on this. And it will block your eyes from exploring and adventuring what you're capable of. There is a man with two eyes, two hands like you, two legs like you, who is making millions while you choose to get a thousand bucks every month and for the government to dictate your income level because they can't continue fudding you if your income level breaks the bracket of receipt, of receiving, don't reduce yourself to a beggar. It is an insult to the God you serve. I know this is harsh. I know we are never taught this. Church is the only place we are corrected. And for your information, I have no idea about your private lives. So this I speak as the Holy Spirit is guiding me. I don't know what you do what works you do. I don't know who is doing what. I don't even know whether anyone here is receiving government relief. But I challenge you right now. You are making use of infrastructure put up by the government. What's the government? The government is the collective people in an economy. You are making use of the roads. You are making use of the electricity. You are making use of the water system. You are making use of the sewer system. You are utilizing the security apparatus. You are safe because you are riding on the sweat of the others. There is no such a thing as a government. You can't show me where is the government. Where is the government? The government is not a building. The government is not White House. The government is not Congress. The government are the other people you are riding on. Everyone must be productive. That's the word of God. And, and I repeat that word again. We say to such lazy people, verse 12, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in don't quote the pastor. Don't say I was harsh on you. Quote Paul and Christ. Do your work quietly, verse 12. Earn your own food. After this service, talk with my mercy. On an average day, I work 16 hours. On an average day. On an average day. When I buy a new car, like last week I bought a brand new Volvo. Somebody comes to ask of my car. I will kick you away to verse 12. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 12. I'll kick your way to that place. I have a right to drive what I have earned. I could have been a burden to you people. I say this to God's glory. I have been the biggest giver in this church. Not to brag. To God's glory. I have set an example as a tent maker. I'm here preaching to you. I stopped working last night at 2. I decree and declare everyone here must be productive. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number four, time boundaries. You must protect your time boundaries. Protect your time. Anyone who wastes your time wastes your life. Do not allow people to interfere with your working hours. Can you believe this? I'm a pastor, yet I do not allow people to interfere with my working hours. You know, there are some folks, some careers, especially the police, at least, the, they should be serving 24 hours. They're on payroll. And so is a pastor who is on payroll. But there are people, literally, 
if they find a tent maker who is doing another job or two or three jobs like I'm doing, they will actually interfere with your working hours. And here I suggest to you as a believer, as a Christian, don't allow your relatives to be calling you out of your workplace. Your life is measured in terms of time. So whoever destroys your time is destroying your life. Don't give anyone permission to interfere with your working hours. Learn to socialize out of working hours. Protect also your waiting time. And this is especially to Africans. We have a tendency of agreeing with someone we are meeting at 4 o'clock. And somebody comes at 6 o'clock. You've got to protect your waiting time. Ladies and gentlemen, you, if you have a relative, a friend, a colleague at work who is notorious in getting late, make it clear to them, you wait for them for 10 minutes, and after that you're gone. No offense. Or let them know we are meeting 4 to 5. Even if you come at 4.50, I have 10 minutes for you. If you come for 4.40, I have 20 minutes for you. At 5 o'clock, I am leaving. You've got to re-educate your social circles that your time is not up for grabs by the highest hydra. Protect your time. Let people respect your time. That's what God has given you to make a difference in this life. Again, this is scriptural. Ephesians 5.16, scripture says, make good use of time because people live in very wrong ways these days. We have people who are time wasters. Someone will come waste your time and they still expect you to send them money. Every time you're sending money, guess what you're sending? Portion of your time. That's what you're sending to them. Time you worked, maybe for eight hours, you're drawing to the same guy who has refused to work and he comes to interfere with you during your working hours. I love my sister Liz. When I give a call to Liz and she's waiting for a client, she tells me as the pastor, pastor, the client is coming in two minutes, we've got to end the call. I salute such people. That's what we need. People who know how to protect their time boundaries. So I also challenge you as a child of God, be strategically rare. Don't be available to all people everywhere. Remember the more the supply, the less the value. The less the supply, the higher the value. That's why diamonds and gold have more value than building rocks because they are rarer. If you're too available in somebody's house, eventually they despise you. Familiarity breeds content. Too much availability, content. Is this me? No, it's the Bible. Proverbs 25, 17. Proverbs 25, 17. Don't visit your neighbors too often or you will wear out your welcome. You will wear out your welcome. You will exhaust the number of visits they are supposed to allow you to go there. If somebody invites you to visit them once, they have not told you this is a restaurant for your dinner. Go for that one visit and then be strategically rare. Give them space. And how do you even get time to be moving from house to house? The Bible charges you in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, mind your own business. Stop being bothered by other people's marriages. Stop being bothered by how other people raise their children. Leave it to me. I'll teach you about parenting and marriages. You be bothered with your marriage. Be bothered with your relationship. Be bothered with your dating. Don't be bothered by how other people are dating. Who is dating who? How does that concern you? What they are making, what they are driving, what they are eating. You know, there are people who visit you. It's not because they are visiting you. They are trying to gauge you. They are trying to check your standards and your class. Lock your house from such inquisitive characters. They're just coming to check the, the, your type of sofa, your type of TV. They're just trying to come and see where is this lady, you know, to measure you. To check you out. Does he measure up to me? Does she measure up to me? Keep away such characters. Tell them, mind your own. Send them this scripture. First Thessalonians 4.11. Mind your own business. And I also encourage you as a church, never offer unsolicited advice. It's unwanted. Don't volunteer yourself to go give marriage counseling to people who didn't invite you. Leave them alone. They are adults. Why are you there when they propose to each other? Advice to the extent somebody reaches out to you. Don't be people's ambulance in readiness for their emergencies. Mind your own 
business. Tell your neighbor, mind your own business. Boundary number, am I preaching good? Is this okay in church? Number five. Boundary number five. Workplace boundaries. Workplace boundaries. I charge you by the masses of the living God. Protect your ability to work professionally. Do not allow somebody simply because they are your supervisor to overstep your professional boundaries. I repeat, your supervisor, your boss, your company is not your source. The moment you allow them to abuse you in your workplace, simply because they are paying you, you are now party to their curse. Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Verse 7. But blessed is the man whose trust is in God. Your confidence, your trust must be in God. Not in any job, not in any company, not in any person. So I suggest today, if somebody goes beyond your job description, if somebody crosses the line of work ethics, if there is any violation in your place of work, whatever kind, sort out with that person. If they do not listen, take it to your HR. If the HR is compromised, escalate to the MD or the, or, or the general manager's office, whatever office is higher. If they are not willing to listen to you, you have an option. You are not a tree planted there. That's why there is provision for resignation. Every company has a clause demanded by law called the dissolution of a company. Even marriages, Moses gave the certificate of divorce. There is no human agreement that cannot be dissolved. Mark this. No single human agreement. That's why we have provisions for resignation and the courts for recourse. If somebody overstepped your boundaries, you escalated to HR, to MD, and they can't listen to you, you have a right to go to the courts and demand your compensation, even as you walk out. You know, being abused by your boss is not Christian suffering. It is not the persecution of the righteous. It is the persecution of the foolish. First Timothy 4.12. Do not let anyone despise you because you are a young man. And it's interesting what Paul was saying because the truth of the matter is the older you are in the game, the older you are in your workplace, the more the years in your place of work, the more people don't joke with you. The people who are abused the most are youngsters in their place of work. When they join the job market, when they don't know the rules of the game, when they are trying to understand how things work, they get into their job, into the job market with a lot of naivety, thinking everyone is as respectful as their mother, everyone is as respectful as their, as their dad or their pastor. So to every young man who will ever hear my voice or this recording, Paul is saying when you go to that place of work, do not let anyone despise you. Because you are novice, because you are young. You also must set the standard of how you want to be treated in your workplace by how you conduct yourself. You've got to conduct yourself professionally. There are times we put ourselves in tricky situations. Ladies and gentlemen, consider a situation where a lady decides to be left alone in the office with a, with a male boss. In an office where there are 500 workers, maybe it's a company setting, a manufacturing firm, there are over 500 workers in the company, and you alone were left together with your boss past working hours. You are there at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. The fact is, you are putting yourself in a tricky situation. You are lacking the wisdom of God. Of course, that does not give your boss a right to abuse you. But you also have to use common sense. Don't put yourself in situations that will tempt someone to overstep their boundaries. First Timothy 4, 12, we continue. It is now talk to us. Show those who believe how they should live. Show them by the way you talk. Show them by the way you live. Show them by the way you love. Show them how to believe by the way you believe. Show them how to live a clean life by the way, you live a clean life. Most of the scriptures I'm reading today from the worldwide English translation. So you must set the standard of how you want others to treat you. 
And finally, number six, and the last one, set sexual boundaries. You have a right to protect your sexual safety. And 20 years ago, this, would, this message would have been directed to dealing with an opposite sex. But we are living at a very strange time. Jesus is about to come. So when we are talking about sexual boundaries here, it doesn't matter the gender these days. So you've got to protect your sexual safety. And I'm not talking about singles. I'm talking about both singles and the married, both gender. Let me start with the singles. If you're single, you have a right to demand people not to touch you inappropriately. Even when you're dating, before somebody has given you an engagement ring, proposed to you, and made a commitment to be your life partner, you have a right to draw very clear boundaries, and not just to your physical space, even allowing them to your house. You've got to say no to anything that can push your sexual safety. And to those who are married, first of all, anyone who is not your life partner, you have a right to tell them, I don't like being touched like this. And when it comes to your life partner, you have a right to tell them, this is beyond my definition of sexual intimacy. Even in marriage, there is sexual abuse. You've got to define your boundaries even in the context of marriage. You've got to agree, yes, the Bible says your body belongs to you and to your partner, but with mutual consent. And the key word here is, no one can dictate to you what you're going to do together as a couple if you're married. No one. No one can dictate to you. However, mutual consent is dictated in scriptures. Let me read a scripture from the worldwide English translation. 1 Corinthians 6.18. This text is both to the singles and to the married. And the Bible says, run away from every kind of wrong sex. Run away from every kind of wrong sex. Why? Every other wrong thing which a person does is done outside of his body, outside of her body. But the person who uses sex the wrong way does a wrong thing to his own body, to her own body. So unless it's rape, it is you who permitted your body to be used. Every other thing, Scripture is saying, is committed to you outside your body, but this is something you're doing wrong to your own body. And you know verse 19 of the same chapter says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is the habitation of the living God. But I also charge you, as you expect other people to respect your sexual boundaries, do not push anyone's sexual boundary. And intimacy is not necessarily going all the way. There are some touches, there are even sexual talks, even looks. You've got to demand your sexual space to be respected. Will you receive the word? Have you been blessed by this message? Please leave a comment and share this video with others. Are you blessed by my ministry? You can partner with me in ministry by sending me your love offering every month through the giving options that I have shared with you on the screen. And if you'd like directions to come to our church in person, drop us a message by WhatsApp at 678-815-3402 and we will text you our church address. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification bell to get notified when I upload new videos. I upload new videos every week. Thank you so much and God bless you.